you have a Bible, look down at Luke chapter 1. You'll be blessed by this. I um, want to talk about the Holy Spirit in the Christmas story and his working in, in this story, which is phenomenal, I think. Um, often, when a relationship is getting more intense, as a relationship grows, um, kind of a, a defining moment in that relationship or, or a key time in that relationship when things start to get serious is you take that person that you've been talking to and you've been going on little dates and little talks, but things can't really get serious until you take them home for Christmas. Am I right? Like, um, you take, or somebody like, well, it wasn't Christmas, it was Easter, but, but there's kind of this time where you go home and they meet the family and you're kind of like, so do you like them? Because I hope you like them. I really, really like them. Am I right? And you, uh, I, I remember that, that first Christmas that um, I took Rebecca to meet my family and then she took me to meet her family and it was, uh, obviously, they just loved me. So uh, it was great. <laughs> my, they, they, my family loved her. It was just phenomenal. What, what I've been studying lately is the Holy Spirit in the Christmas story. And here's what's neat to me. You meet the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came down on believers at Pentecost. But you didn't meet the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It's kind of like God brings him home at Christmas. And you get to meet this one that you're going to have a long-term, growing, intimate relationship with. You meet him at Christmas. In fact, over 13 times the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Christmas story. Is that awesome? I'm sorry, not 13, nine that's still a lot. Nine, you know, nine times, Bueller. Uh, nine times it is, uh, it is the, the work of the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Uh, he is just phenomenal all through this, uh, this story. Let me tell you this. This week, this coming week, can be absolutely awesome. Or, you probably already figured this out, it could be terrible. But... What the, what the changing factor in that is, is not your circumstances, is not your paycheck, is not your spouse. What will affect whether or not you have a great week or a bad week is your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because the circumstances are gonna come. Your spouse is gonna say what they're gonna say. Christmas is gonna, gonna happen as it happens. The world is gonna move as it moves. But what changes is the inner you and the working of the Spirit. And you can either be, hear me, hear me, hear me, you can either be close, intimate, fellowship, friends with the Spirit of God, or you can be adversaries. That affects your entire week. Amen? Um, show you some of these uh, these, these just accounts throughout the Christmas story. Uh, you write these down if you want. Um, the Holy Spirit in the Christmas story, it, it's, uh, the Spirit appears in Luke 1, 5, Matthew 1, 8, Matthew 1, 20, Luke 1, 35, Luke 1, 41, Luke 1, 67, Luke 2, 25, Luke 2, 26, and Luke 2, 27. Did you get all that? Uh, or let me kind of categorize it this way. Uh, number one, the Holy Spirit first appears um, saying that he would fill John the Baptist. In fact, uh, Zechariah, who would be the father of John the Baptist, is in the temple. He is lighting incense. An angel of God appears to him at the incense altar, standing to its right. The angel tells him, your wife, Elizabeth, even though she's old, is going to have a baby. And in fact, the angel says this, that baby that's going to be born, John the Baptist, he will be filled, this is Luke uh, 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 15, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth, which is what the Holy Spirit does in you also. From new birth, he fills your life. Not only uh, would the Holy Spirit fill John the Baptist, but write this down also. We also find him in the Christmas story. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit was at work at the incarnation. The incarnation is that God became flesh. Um, listen to this. And uh, Wait, wait. Let me preach before I read it to you. What this is going to say is, where did Jesus' body come from? If you don't have a man and a woman come together and physically create that, where does, how, does, how does Jesus get a body? Ever wonder that? Here's the answer. To, and it's so exciting. I'll be excited for you. Yeah. So, amen. Be excited. For, second search, just there like bumps on a log. <laughs> Matthew 1.18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she's found to be with child through 
the Holy Spirit. Uh, when Joseph hears about this, he says, I don't think so, and gets ready to divorce her. And it's again affirmed that the body of Jesus is the work of the Spirit of God, Matthew 1.20. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to come home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Uh, Mary, the, the angel appears to Mary and she gets a little more details than Joseph did because she asked some questions. She says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? How is a body going to be created inside of me if, there, if there's like this is impossible? The angel answered Mary. This is Luke 135. The Holy Spirit. Over and over and over, the work of the Spirit in the creation of the body of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. God will bypass the natural processes of the human body. And uh, in fact, that, that word there, to overshadow, means to surround or encompass. You will be enveloped by the Holy Spirit and the normal Physical processes of your body, Mary, are going to be overcome. Uh, God is going to suspend the laws of nature and the natural order that people are born. And what is going to happen inside of Mary is going to be wholly unique. Um, God will bypass the, the human means of forming babies. And the Holy Spirit himself will create the body of Jesus. Um, it, or if I put it this way, Jesus wasn't created in the womb. Jesus simply entered the womb. The Holy Spirit made the body. Does that make sense? Um, write this down also. Not only did the Holy Spirit um, fill John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit's work in the incarnation, I also noticed the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and it says in Luke 1, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Elizabeth, watch this. The baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She says, bless, isn't that beautiful? All of a sudden she is just overcome with the, with the spirit and the presence of, of God. Later, um, Zechariah, remember Zechariah who has prophesied that his wife would, would have John the Baptist. Um, earlier, the angel Gabriel had told Zechariah all of the details and Zechariah had doubted God, and he said, how can this be? I don't understand. Um, my wife is old. I'm old. Are you sure? And the angel said, you're just going to be quiet now. Um, just be silent. When the baby was born, Zechariah hadn't talked for nine months. The baby is born, and Elizabeth said, we're going to name him John. And everybody said, oh, are you sure? Have you checked with the father? You nobody, nobody else in your family is named John. Why would you name him John? And Zechariah took a writing tablet and he wrote, his name is John. As soon as he obeyed the Holy Spirit, his tongue was loosed. And it says this, um, at that moment, it says, his father was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he prophesied. And what he prophesied is called Zechariah's song. And that is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Zechariah's uh, life. Uh, what's interesting to me is for all of these references, there's no reference to the Holy Spirit on the actual night that Jesus was born. Isn't that interesting? But if you just kind of look at the story, you see the work of the Holy Spirit. Who do you think led Joseph and Mary to just the right place out in the fields there in Bethlehem? Who do you think caused not just one shepherd to be sitting out there, but caused a group of shepherds to gather their sheep together in just the right place? They'd be right within what Who do you think led the, the wise men on that, that journey? Myra, I just think you see the Holy Spirit. All, but then as you come toward the end of what we call the, the Christmas narrative, the birth narrative, there is one more reference to the Holy Spirit, but it happens like an avalanche of references. So it's one person, but the Holy Spirit's mentioned about three times in this old guy's life. And that is, uh, just write this down, that the Holy Spirit would lead Simeon. There's an old man here named Simeon, and he's kind of exciting. Um, when you, amen? When you're reading the Christmas story, um, just keep reading. Because you got to get to Simeon. It says in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 16, uh, the baby's born, all of that. It says the shepherds hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. They tell everyone they glorify God. Verse 21, on the eighth day, when the time came to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Um, which means Yahweh saves. It is the Hebrew name Joshua, Jesus. Um, 
verse 22. When the time of their, their, the babies and her purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. They're going into the temple. Now, look down at verse 25. There was an old man, it just says man. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who is righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit. Did you catch this line here? The Holy Spirit is on him. What you're gonna see in, um, in Simeon is you're gonna see a working in his life that to us is an example of how we should live by the Holy Spirit. So all of a sudden you have the Holy Spirit work in Mary. You have the Holy Spirit working in Zechariah. You have the Holy Spirit working in Elizabeth and in John the Baptist and all of these characters. But then shining out from among these is this old man Simeon because it's not just a momentary work. You have an old man whose every step has been guided by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And I think we're supposed to kind of stand back and say, wait, 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 wait. I want to be like that old man. And so um, as believers filled with the Spirit of God, uh, let me ask this. What does it mean to follow the Holy Spirit? Um, What does it mean for you to to have the Spirit of of God? I just wrote down about about three things here uh, that I want every believer to kind of hold on to. Um, What should my relationship with the Holy Spirit be? Well, write this down. Number one, I think that like Simeon, we should welcome the Holy Spirit. We should welcome the Holy Spirit and the, the Spirit's work in, in our lives. Um, you know, Simeon lived a life that really his life in every step welcomed the Spirit of God. Um, you say, well, how would I not welcome the Spirit of God? When you live a life that is full of cursing, anger, rage, when you live a life filled with the flesh, your flesh you're really saying to the Spirit of God, I don't want you here. I want to live my way and do my thing. But notice the way that Simeon lived was a, was a life that, that just magnified the Holy Spirit. Look back down there at Luke chapter 2, verses 16 to 35, and let me read you a little bit fuller account of what, what happens here. Joseph and Mary come. They, they circumcise the baby on the eighth day. They offer then the offerings that are required for, um, for the purification. And then it says this. Uh, Look at Luke chapter two, verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was, now this is the kind of life he lives. You want the Holy Spirit to work greatly in you. You want to have a great week. You want to be guided. And Christians can get a little bit pious about, yes, I want to be guided by the Spirit of God. Well, let me ask you this. Do you live a righteous, devout life? Um, It says, there is in Jerusalem a man called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He lives a life that welcomes the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of God can make his home in him. Uh, righteous or devout, elibius is the, is the Greek word. It means reverent toward God, God-fearing, pious. He is careful to obey God. He honors God. And it says this, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. By the way, did you get the three references to the Holy Spirit in this guy's life? Uh, The Spirit is upon him. The Holy Spirit has revealed to him he won't die until he sees the Messiah. He's now moved every step into the courts um, being led by the Holy Spirit. So uh, it says, when the parents brought the child to do for him, Jesus, what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms. Now, to be clear, I, I, don't, I, I don't know, uh, the, Simeon's not the one performing the ceremony. The parents come in, they're carrying the baby. There's already a priest there. And in walks the old prophet. He walks up. Hey, moms, have you ever had somebody after you've had that baby and you've got to kind of, and you watch moms, they, they wrap their children like still in swaddling clothes. They wrap them, wrap them, wrap them, wrap, wrap them. Uh, your kid looks like Randy from the Christmas story. You know, it's like this, the little kid can't move, can't put his arms down. I mean, you wrap, wrap, wrap. And after you wrap that kid 20,000 times and mummify them, you put them in that carrier and then you put the blanket over the carrier, which means this, don't, I just want my child near me, but I don't want you all breathing on them. And what do people do? They come up and they move that, that thing. Ah, oh, you have a baby, you know, and you're like, just go. I don't go nowhere, right? 
Can you imagine? They're in the temple and they're holding the, 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 the priest is about to take the baby and in walks an old man. And this is the Messiah. The son of God has been revealed to them by angels that they have custody of the living God in their hands. And an old man just walks in and kidnaps their kid. He walks in and takes the baby in his arms and just starts prophesying. I'm telling you, that's a moment. I wonder if Joseph looked at Mary like, Who, who's the old guy? Why, what? When the parents had brought the child to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms. And he just starts praising God. He praised God saying, sovereign Lord, as you have promised now, dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. I'm holding in my hands the salvation that one day will go to the cross and bear the sins of the world. And this old man is overcome with the glory of God. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepare in the sight of all people. A light for revelation of the Gentiles and the glory for your people, Israel. What stood out to me is this old guy just obeys the Holy Spirit everywhere the Holy Spirit sends him. He just goes and does what the Spirit of God wants him to do. Your life will be under the control of something. You're gonna be influenced by something. Uh, you, you know, the Bible says, if you wanna be led by the Spirit, uh, Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. You know what debauchery is? You watch it every November 10th, right? Uh, which leads to debauchery. Instead, it says, be filled with the Spirit. And it means this, when, you are, um, when, when you're drunk, you are under the influence of alcohol. Um, the Bible says you cannot be under the influence of other things and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And you put, apply a lot of stuff to that. You cannot be under the influence of rage and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be under the influence of pornography and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be under the influence of gossip and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be cussing and under the influence of vulgarity and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he said, so he says, look, look, I'm just gonna do one thing. I'm going to serve the Lord. And what that means, it sound, doesn't it sound, um, sound great to say, I'm just filled with the Spirit. Because what, the way we usually picture filled with the Spirit, I'm filled with the Spirit, like, yes. If I were to say to you, do you want to be filled with the Spirit? And you're like, yes, I want to be filled. And the way we picture filled with the Spirit is that you're going to come into church now look, you already bear from the moment of your salvation, the Holy Spirit lives in you, but there are moments that you just feel the Holy Spirit fill you up. Am I right? And the way we picture the filling of the Spirit is you're gonna come in church and you're just gonna have this awesome, beautiful worship experience and Holy Spirit is gonna flow down on you. And sometimes that happens, but that's not all there is to the filling of the Spirit of God. The filling of the Spirit of God is when you obey him. To be filled with the Spirit means he gets the final say in every decision. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. It means that you obey him. And if I can put it this way, the filling of the Spirit is not just an emotion. An emotion may come with it. Um, the, whole, the filling of the Holy Spirit is the decision to obey him every step of the way. And that's what, that, that's what Simeon does is he just welcomes the, the Spirit of, of God. Um, Write this down also. Not only do you want to welcome the Holy Spirit, just write this down with that. Obey the Holy Spirit. Obey the Holy Spirit. Now what Simeon does, everywhere he goes, the Holy Spirit's just leading him along. And he just follows and does what God wants him to do and obeys him. I'll tell you a secret about God. God is going to give you assignments and ask you to do things. And one of the ways you know they're from God is they're gonna scare you to death. Amen. Am I right? Um, every God-sized assignment is, um, is bigger than you. And here's what God does. God takes his Holy Spirit and he puts his Holy Spirit in you that you're gonna welcome and you're gonna obey. And that Holy Spirit now lives in you and he's gonna give you spiritual gifts to carry out the assignment he gives you. But here's what, hey, I think we get this completely backward in Christianity. So here's Christianity today. We go, what I gotta do is I gotta find my spiritual gift. Got it backward. Find the assignment, then look for the gift. And here's why. Sometimes God doesn't give you the gift you need to have until you say yes to the assignment he's already given you. 
That's called walking by faith. Look, it's walking by sight to say, I have this gift, therefore I'll go do this thing. Usually what happens is God tells you to go do something. You go, I can't do that. And God goes, I know you're going to have to depend on me and on the gifting of the spirit. And I'll empower you to teach Sunday school. I'll empower you to preach. I'll empower you to be a missionary. I'll empower you to go out. I'll empower you to do these things that, that, that you think on your own, I could never do that. God says, you're right. You could never do that, but I can do that because I'm God and I'm in you. I just put it, uh, did, did, did I say it this way already? Look for the calling before you look for the gifting. Does that make sense? Because we're going, God, what's my gift? What's my gift? What's my gift? Instead, just ask God, God, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I think the Christian life is one of getting to know the spirit of God that already lives in you. Already walks beside you. Go into a youth building and they are, we have wonderful youth leaders. Um, go in there and they're studying the Holy Spirit. I say, anything you want to tell us about the Spirit of God? I said, yeah, let me tell you about the Spirit of God. I said, when you were lost, there was just you inside your body, just you. And now it kind of gets quiet in the youth room. They're like, where, where is he going with this? You're right, me is inside my body. Very good. I said, yeah, really. It was just you in your body. So let me tell you about when you got saved. When you got saved, God took his spirit. God is spirit. Now, I can't take my spirit out of me and put my spirit inside of you, and you can't take your spirit out of you and put it inside of me. Your spirit's slightly stuck inside your body. Am I right? Until you die, your spirit is set free from the body, but temporarily right now, we live in the body. Now, here's the awesome thing. God is not stuck inside a body. God is spirit. And so God takes his spirit when you got saved and there was just lonely little you inside your body. You already feel lonely, don't you? And everywhere you went, you went alone. And everything you did, you did alone. And then God put his Holy Spirit inside of you. And all of a the sudden, there wasn't just you inside of you. There was you and the Holy Spirit inside of you. And all of a sudden, you smile. You got, this is what I said to the teenagers. I said, you guys got a roommate. And living in your body now, everywhere you go, you're taking the whole, come on, Holy Spirit. In fact, usually it's the Holy Spirit saying to you, come on. And you can feel the Holy Spirit inside of you. He, and, and what your life is about as a Christian is getting to know that spirit of God that lives inside of you. Because there's that other spirit. I'm gonna tell you guys, you can feel the spirit talking to you. You can, am I right? You can feel the spirit when he objects to something. You can feel the spirit when he's grieved. You can feel the spirit when he's, when he's hurt. I think that's doc. I don't. I, I know that's doctrine. I think that's doctrine that's exciting. I mean, if that doesn't excite you, the Holy Spirit literally came down at Pentecost in fire. So that's doctrine on fire. Very exciting. Saw so, um, a documentary. I don't remember who. I, I don't know. There's so many streaming services. I lost track of who shows what. But it's called uh, Worst Roommate Ever. Did you see Worst Roommate Ever? Um, don't don't bother. But I thought nobody saw this. Oh, this is great. Apparently it bombed. Um, I thought it was going to be about like hoarders. Like, oh, I, I invited this, this guy or this lady to move in. And wow, were they ever a hoarder? That's not what it was. It wasn't like they were hoarders or kind of messy or stunk up the fridge. Worst roommate ever was like this person came to live in, in my house and they were a serial killer. They, they murdered this person and buried this lady in the backyard. And they, it was all these police files and the people that lived with them. Question. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, I think a wonderful question is this. What kind of a presence lives in me? If you've got a roommate, is it the worst roommate ever? Hear me, it's not the worst roommate ever. What you got when the Holy Spirit moved into you is you got the best roommate ever. Sitting there uh, just taking notes and I'm, I'm looking at the, at the Christmas story. I'm like, wow. If I kind of look at the Christmas story and I study the Holy Spirit, I start to see the personality of the Holy Spirit in the Christmas story. Am I right? So looking at the angels and they come down and they say, they're talking about joy. And I wrote down, that's, why the person, that's part of the person of the Holy Spirit. I thought, that's, that's joy. And I thought about the Holy Spirit creating the body of Jesus with so much love. And I wrote down love. And I, I, I looked at those angels again and they say, peace on earth. And I wrote down peace. I thought, now if I really keep looking, I'm gonna find the, the personality of the Spirit of God. And after a while, it's like the Holy Spirit just goes, boom, hits you on the head. Ow! What? Let's look at the list. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And here's what I realized. Hey, listen, I preached an entire, I, I, I wrote an entire sermon to tell you this. The personality of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. You're not excited by that because you didn't live with that for two months waiting to say it. You're just like, yep. But it was revolutionary to me. I'm just kind of going through the Christmas story and I'm noticing love, joy, peace, patience. And suddenly I realize all this time I've gone this far in ministry and this far in life and not fully understood that the fruit of the spirit that's supposed to be produced in me is the very presence and personality of the spirit of God. When the spirit of God moves into me and I obey the spirit of God, what kind of a roommate did I get? Not the worst roommate ever. I got a roommate of total love. I got a roommate of total peace. I got a roommate that overflows with what, and the reason you produce the fruit of the spirit is because that's the personality of he who's in you and he's changing you to be like him. Well, what am I like? You're going to be more loving. You're going to be more kind. Smile. You are going to be more patient and you're going to be nicer too to your kids, teachers, right? Um, Write this down. Not only do you welcome the Holy Spirit and you, and you obey the Holy Spirit, but number three, what you've got to do is you've got to follow the Holy Spirit. That's what Simeon does. You want a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you welcome him, you obey him. But I think Simeon was directed by the Holy Spirit moment by moment. And it was just the big things. And a lot of times we're like, God, you tell me what you want me to do. And I'll just go take, God's like, no, no, I'm going to direct you every step of the way. And the reason God doesn't always show us the big picture is we take shortcuts. So God just goes, take this step. Where, where are we going, God? I can, no, no, walk there. Now what? Walk there. Could you tell me where the, no, no, no. Just keep walking. Just follow me step by step. Simeon, we're going to the temple today. Okay. Go over there. Okay. Take that baby. Are you crazy? You know, they got temple guards and CPS and all kinds of stuff. Lord. Look down there at verse 27, moved by the spirit, he went to the temple court. Simeon, God didn't tell him ahead of time, just today, hey, Simeon, we're going to the temple today. Okay. Go on into that court there. Go, oh, okay. Um, Jesus said in John 16, 13, he said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. That's what the Holy Spirit does is he guides you every day. He enters the, the temple courts and he takes that baby. I love, I love what he prays. He says, my eyes have seen your salvation. I'm holding it right. That's what the Holy Spirit does is he just opens your eyes to stuff you never saw uh, before. I love the way that every step sin took was in concert with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? Everywhere he went, God was, God was late. Um, I'll tell you this. I think every person who's been filled with the Spirit of God, you've been saved, God fills you with his presence. All of you can think of times God clearly guided you outside your own thinking or understanding. You can think back to times that God told you to do something. Uh, God, you know, by the way, you know, he even guided you to salvation. You didn't come to Jesus because you're smart. You came to Jesus because he called and the spirit prompted. Um, see, that's you know, why it's quiet in here is you're like, I thought I was smart. You are, you're very smart. But your intelligence did not get you to Jesus. The Spirit of God moved on your heart and you responded in obedience to the Spirit of God. And he led you to himself. You think of God guided you to be baptized. I, you, some of you can think, you know, God guided me to this church. God guided me in my marriage. God guided me. Some of you would say God guided me not to get divorced. God guide, some of you would say there was a moment that God just guided me to speak the truth. Or there was a moment that God guided me not to speak the truth at that moment. Have you, ever, have you ever just had truth right there and you're ready to drop the truth bomb, right? And the Holy Spirit says, just shut up for a moment. And you're like, but it's so good, Lord. I have stuff that I'd like to share with them now. And the Holy Spirit says, you just be quiet right now. Let me, um, let me work. You can, you can probably think of times that the Holy Spirit just put it on your heart to ask someone, are, are you okay? And you were just guided by the Holy Spirit. Um, think of times the Holy Spirit asked you to write a note or to give someone a gift. 
the Holy Spirit working in you, guiding you, he's, as you read the Bible, he's going to be bringing verses to mind and thoughts to mind. Uh, he's going to deeply lead your heart. As awesome as it sounds, by the way, to follow the Holy Spirit, can I tell you, um, this isn't on your notes, but just write this down on something. Uh, what it means to follow the Holy Spirit, to obey the Holy Spirit, to welcome the Holy Spirit, it means you're going to be interrupted a lot. Everybody doing something great for God was doing something else when God came. They were already busy. And here's going to be your temptation. Hey, Mary was planning a wedding. Am I right? Joseph was planning a wedding. Everybody that God speaks to is already busy. When God comes to you and starts wanting you to do stuff, your natural answer is, excuse me, hold on. Wait till I'm out of 29 Palms. I'm busy right now. You think you're busy in 29 Palms in the middle of nowhere? Wait till you get there. Um... When's the last time you just said, Lord, you've got permission to interrupt me? Go with uh, Rebecca and I were at the movies. It's an old guy, kind of sick. This is a young pastor, a different church. It's an old guy named Lee Deck was sick, and he's in the hospital. And we're getting ready. We're watching the previews. And I said to her, I just feel like we're not supposed to be here. We're supposed to be over at that hospital. And she quickly said, well, let's, let's go. Let's leave. Got up, we leave the theater, and we go over to that hospital. And the moment I walked in, his wife, Ruth, said, I don't know how you knew, but I, I, I'm just about to sign the papers to take him off the machines. This moment. And I stood there. She signed those papers, and I went into that room, and I held Lee's hand as they took him off those machines, and he stepped from here and stepped in to heaven. But I would have missed all that and gotten a movie. I don't remember what the movie was. Some 90, they didn't make good movies in the 90s anyway, but um, something. But... God's going to do that. He's just going to put stuff on your heart that just interrupts your schedule. Um, I want you to think about this. When's the last time you just acknowledged the Holy Spirit's presence in your life? I mean, really acknowledged. I've, you're here in my body with me. And I welcome you. I'm so glad you're here. When's the last time you told the Holy Spirit, you're the best roommate ever? Isn't that a great prayer? Um. You want this week to be awesome? Hey, the circumstances are coming either way. The only thing that changes this week is your relationship with the Spirit of God. I'm gonna close with this and then I'll just give you time with the Lord. Come on up, praise team. Um, go to the store. And um, I hate going to the store. I used to sit in the car. This is just my wicked me. I used to sit in the car and just wait for Rebecca while she was in the store. Um, but she won't go anymore. <laughs> So I'm in the store as I'm going in on what's usually a chore. I do not like going through any store. I get my card, I'm headed in. And my friend John is getting off, off work. He says, hey, what you doing? I'm going to your store, John. And John goes, I'll go with you. And we just start walking through the store and we're laughing and joking the way that only John can joke. And all of a sudden, this trip that's usually drudgery is wonderful. And he does all these little insider things. Like, I start to throw some of the cards. No, no, no. Don't get that. Get this over here. Look, look. It's behind this over here. Look, get this. This is cheaper. It's the same thing. It's great. We're going through there. I'm saving money. I'm happy. I'm singing jingle bells. World is better. You know why? Same circumstances, same stores, same prices. Well, not quite same prices because I'm with John. But same everything except one thing. When the company's good, the circumstances are different. You already see it, don't you? You're gonna walk into this week and some of you are walking into this week like a guy walking into a store that doesn't really wanna go. And you're gonna hit Monday morning like, ah, let's get my cart and go. Or you can recognize this at this very moment. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you the way John Burke walked with Pastor David through Skater Brothers. And you can say, Holy Spirit, what if you said this this week? This just might change everything. What if you said this week at this altar, Holy Spirit, I just welcome you. I know you're here, but sometimes I kind of forget and I just push my cart through life. Mad. Wouldn't this week be different if you just started the week by acknowledging the presence of the Holy Spirit? But let me push that a little further because I'm a preacher. What if you also said, Holy Spirit, this week I'm gonna obey you in everything you lead me to do. 
You tell me to reach out to somebody, I'm gonna reach out to somebody. You tell me to love somebody, I'm gonna love somebody. You tell me to, to, to sacrifice, you tell me to give. You, whatever you tell me to do, God, I wanna do it. And I know this week will be dramatically different. The greatest work of the Holy Spirit is he reveals Christ to our hearts. And the reason you came to Jesus, the reason you believe is the Holy Spirit revealed Christ to you. Some of you need to take that first step because you don't have the Holy Spirit until you have the Messiah, Jesus. When you take that step and you choose to follow Jesus, he puts his spirit in you. But you've got to take that first step of obedience to the spirit to follow Jesus. So let me just give you time at an altar. You may want to just come and say, Holy Spirit, I acknowledge you today. Others of you may need to make decisions of obedience. Let me just open this church to you and invite you to come as we sing. Would you stand? You are welcome in this place, church family. Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmasbaptistchurch.com.